Our Father, we thank you for this privilege of recommitting our lives to you. Thank you for the privilege of knowing that since we have met you and you have chosen us and you have appointed us and you have placed us on the battlefield, that we will serve you until we die. Amen. Father, we pray that our commitment and consecration will be confirmed by your power, by your spirit, so we'll never look back in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we know there's so much work to do. And you've told us a lot of things during this Congress. And we have made a lot of promises to you. And we have a great vision. And it's a great responsibility upon every one of us. And Father, we pray, nothing will make us look back in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, O oh Lord, that all that we need in strength, in power, in grace, you'll give every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you bless us and open our eyes again as we look at your word even now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This morning we're considering the message, fulfilling our calling. Fulfilling our calling. We need to understand that we have been called. One, we are called to be saints. In Romans chapter 1 and in verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ already as you have seen on the program that we have a calling and it is necessary that we understand what that calling is all about so that we will be able to fulfill the call that God has given us. In the passage I've read to you, you've seen number one, we are called to be saints. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God, too. We are called to be stewards. You see, the mysteries of the gospel has been committed into our hands. And we are supposed to serve like stewards do serve. We are supposed to take this meal, this food, this bread of life from us and give it to the people that are hungry, the people that are waiting. And as stewards, we must be faithful. Turn with me to Second Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Number 3, we are called to be soldiers. And as soldiers, not civilians, we must not live an indulgent life. We must not live a life of the ordinary person on the street. We are called to the battlefield. And like our soloists beautifully sang for us, we are on the battlefield for our Lord. And we have promised him that we are going to serve him till we die. So then, what's our calling? Number one, we are called to be saints. And as saints, we must live saintly, righteous, blameless, spotless, godly lives. Number two, we have been called to be stewards of the mysteries of the gospel 
And as stewards, we must be faithful. Between the place you are served or you take the meal, the food, to the point you serve the food to those who are hungry waiting on the table, nothing must drop off from the plate. You must earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You've seen number three. We are called to be the soldiers of Christ. And as soldiers of Christ, we cannot be regretting for all the troubles we have, all the pains we have. And we cannot be saying the battle is too hard. We cannot be saying the going is too rough. Or we cannot be saying the place where we need to serve the people is so far we cannot reach them. Sure, there is hardness in the battle. Sure, there is something to endure. That's why it says, therefore, endure hardness or trial or persecution or difficulty or trouble as a good soldier of Christ. Number four. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are called to be students, students of the word. You see, many people forget that we ought to learn of Christ. He said, All ye that labor and are heavy laden, he said, Come unto me and learn of me. We never stop learning. There is a lot to learn. We need to learn more of Christ every day. We need to learn from the word of God every day. Do you remember that when Jesus rose from the dead, he came to his own disciples and he opened up the scriptures unto them and he made them to understand the scriptures. And from then on, they kept on learning. In fact, he told them at the end of his ministry on earth, he said, don't think we've finished the syllabus. Don't think you've learned everything you ought to learn. You know what he said? He said, there are many, many things I should have told you, but I've not told you. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all things. And you see, from the moment you even receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost, you've not stopped learning. We're still students of the word. And it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. You know, it's so very unfortunate that a lot of preachers, they don't study. They don't know that we have a calling. A calling to be students of the word of God. A calling to be students of the need of the people. A calling to be students of the Lord Jesus Christ. A calling to be, to be students of the biographies of great men in the Bible. I'm sure you know what we call biographies and autobiographies. Those are things that are written about the lives of these great people in the world. The people that the world call heroes. But then we have a lot of them in the Bible. If you turn, don't turn now, just write it down. If you turn to Hebrews alone, Hebrews chapter 11 gives you a lot of people that you ought to be interested about their biographies. You ought to be interested about what the Bible has to say about them. People like Enoch, people like Abel, people like Abraham, people like Sarah, people like Deborah, people like Moses, people like Jephthah, people like Joshua, people like David, and a host of other people in Bible days. You ought to be students, one, of the word of God, two, of Christ himself, three, of the doctrines of the Bible, four, of these great men in Bible days, the people that dared to do things and you ought to specialize in studying about the characters and the lives of people in the New Testament. How could God take a person like Saul of Tarsus and use that man in a brief period of time and make him to go all over the then known world and preach the gospel where Christ has not been named? You ought to study the lives of those people. You need to study to show yourselves approved unto God. Remember, number one, we are called to be saints. Number two, we are called to be stewards. Number three, we are called to be soldiers. Number four, we are called to be students. 
Number five, we are called to be servants. Servants of God. In verse 24 of this same place that we have opened, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, we ought to know that we are called to be servants. And as servants of the Lord, we need to instruct those that oppose themselves. You see that in verse 25. He says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. That means those that are self-contradictory. Those that contradict themselves. They are religious and irreligious at the same time. They are human and inhuman at the same time. They are knowledgeable in the things of the world and ignorant at the same time. It appears they have civilization, but they are primitive at the same time. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the student world. The people that, even though they are human, and you can see with all their frailty, with all their weaknesses, they look human. You know, they are weak. And that's the symbol. That's the characteristic of a human being. But then, they are so inhuman, and so callous, and so hard, and so heady, and so stubborn. They become inhuman at the same time. They tell us they are civilized. They tell us they have knowledge. They tell us that they know all things, and we don't need to come and instruct them, but at the same time, we know they are very, very ignorant. You see a man, a boy or a girl, in your own case, reaching out to these students. These students may seem to know all about physics, but they know nothing, or next to nothing, how to apply all that they are learning in their own lives. And if I told you, a lot of things that our children learn, our students learn, and they do not know any application at all. Civilized, yes, all the same, ignorant. Appear to have the light because they tell us knowledge is light. And yet, living and groping in darkness, they contradict themselves. It appears the same. You don't need to direct me. I know the way. I can counsel myself. And I can show myself the way I ought to go. And yet, they are missing the point and missing the way all the time. And you have a responsibility. You have a calling. You are servants of the Lord. So that you will in meekness, in lowliness, in humility, through the grace of God and the wisdom of God, be able to instruct those that oppose themselves. Let's stop here and think about this. We're talking about fulfilling our calling. What is our calling? I've just told you five points in our calling now. That we are called to be saints. And that's the very first thing. We need to understand that we should live saintly lives. If we are following the Lord, preaching is not number one. Living out the life is number one. Because Jesus Christ said, let your light so shine that people may see your good works and it'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. He said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. So then let us understand that Christ gave himself that he may make you part of the glorious church without spot, without wrinkle, without any such thing so that you will live a godly life. A righteous life a life without blame a life without blemish so then your calling everywhere you go as you go back to your various states remember anywhere anytime you are faced with temptation remember I'm supposed to be a saint it's not only Saint Matthew Saint Mark Saint Luke Saint John Saint Peter Saint Patrick Saint Augustine what's your name put your name there you're a saint and you are supposed to live as a saint. We're not supposed to live like sinners. We're different. We're people that are supposed to shine for the Lord. So then, this is your calling. You are called to be a saint. 
And if a sage, how do you fulfill that calling? We'll talk about that later. You know now that you are a steward. And I, I don't have never seen a steward that will go to the place they're serving at the maybe cafeteria or maybe at the uh, place you go to eat outside. And this, uh, you know, steward will take the food. And while he's bringing it to the man, on the, sitting on the table, he'll dip his hand on the in the food, in the plate, and then put one piece of meat in the mouth. And then while he's serving the fellow, he'll say, excuse me, please, uh, I'm, too, I'm hungry too. And then he'll take, um, you know, the Fanta or whatever, and drink a little bit of it. You know what that means? The way they receive it is the way they deliver it. That's what it means to be a steward. Do you know there are a lot of people that are trying to serve and then they receive it from the word of God before they get to the people they are serving, they have removed the restitution out of it. They have removed the holiness message out of it. They have removed the baptism in the Holy Spirit out of it. They have removed the fact that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever out of the plate that they are serving. By the time they get to the people, they are serving the bread of life. The bread is no more complete. They have dipped their hand into it. Please, would you be a faithful steward and serve the way you have received? And honestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. You see, I see a lot of people, they easily get discouraged. They easily, you know, begin to cry and say, I don't know this is how hard it will be. They don't know they have a calling to be a soldier. Have you ever found a soldier on the side of the road near your village? And you see sitting down and he's crying with his gun by his side, all dressed in uniform. And then as you are going, maybe during the holidays, you are following daddy or mommy to the farm. And, uh, you know, while you are going on the way, the soldier stops you. And he says, can I have a piece of bread here? And uh, you are surprised to see him or completely armed. You say, what's the matter with you? Why are you sitting on the side of the road? Well, he says, I'm a, a soldier in the army. But you see, the drill and the trotting and the jogging became so hard. All the others are, you know, over there now. They are still jogging and preparing for the battle. But you know, and then before he finished his message, he began to cry like a baby. Oh, you say, this one is a spoiled fellow. This one is not a soldier. This one is not a real soldier. What were they looking at that they recruited such a fellow like this into the army? I'm talking about you. That because of a little difficulty, because of a little discouragement, the rest of the soldiers are still there on the battlefield and they're evangelizing. And because a little child having, um, you know, maybe familiar spirit said, I will show you. And that night you had a little bad dream. The next day you are supposed to go to the school and go to reach out to those people. You are sitting by the side of the road. There's a Bible in your hand. You know about the blood of Jesus. You know about the power of the Holy Spirit. You know about the mandate of evangelism. You know about the great commission. You know about the second coming of the Lord. You are sitting by the side of the road. And somebody sees you and says, Are you not one of those DLSO workers? What's the matter with you? Why are you sitting down here? I had a bad dream last night. When I went to the school to visit them last week, you know, one of those secondary two girls said she will show me and she showed me and I will never forget. I had such a bad dream. I don't know what I will do now. How can I go back and face those people? What's the matter with you? What have you done with the blood of Jesus Christ? What have you done with the promises of the Lord? Didn't the Bible say no man shall be able to stand before you? I think if no man shall be able to stand before you, no girl shall be able to stand before you. What do you think of David who defeated Goliath and then he came back home and is crying because of a cockroach or mosquito? Well, say David, rise up. If you can kill a giant, you can kill a mosquito. Am I right? If no man shall be able to stand before you, why are you sitting at the side of the road saying, I can't do it again. I can't do it again. I cannot visit the schools again. The difficulty is so much. Rise up, you are a soldier. And I told you that you ought to be students of the word of God. You know, for those of us who are, uh, you know, visiting schools and reaching out to schools, it is not enough to just have a quiet time in the morning. You know, some people say, I'm still having my quiet time. That's not enough. What if I came, 
you know, to you and I said, praise the Lord. You know, I'm still having my quiet time. Oh, you look at me strangely. You'll say, ah, is that news? We, we took it for granted. You should be having your quiet time. Shouldn't I be having quiet time? But if that is where I stop, that will be terrible. I have to be a student. I have to be studying all the time. And you know, I never leave studying. In fact, if I wanted to, I couldn't because it's just part of me. I'm reading a book now and it's called um, AD 2000. Count down on AD 2000. And what it means is this. We're looking at how to evangelize the world by 2000 AD. And in that book, I have more than 168 strategies on how to evangelize the world. And just 10 of those strategies will make you to be able to evangelize not just Nigeria alone, not just Africa alone. I'm talking about evangelizing the whole world. I'm studying all the time. Not only that, I study about Africa. I study, I study a lot of things. You know, some time ago, I went to the United States. I went to Britain. And uh, this uh, Christian Union uh, in the college, uh, they heard about my being in Britain. I was in this particular school. And as I was in that school, sorry, in that church, uh, preaching to the people. So the Christian Union heard that, uh, you know, I came from Nigeria. So they said they would like me to come and talk to them. So I said, that's all right. And uh, during the afternoon, one of the ministers there, the assistant pastor, he took me to the Christian Union. And then we finished uh, the meeting. I preached to them from the Bible. But then while I was preaching, the sociology class at the university, they heard that uh, a Nigerian is around and, you know, he studied mathematics and was a lecturer before. And so they said, well, when he finishes, please call him. We want to know whether he can speak to our sociology students. Not Bible now and not, uh, you know, scripture, not gospel, not evangelism, just talk to us about sociology. And uh, so when I finished and, you know, I preached the message to the Christian Union and prayed for them and counseled, then the assistant pastor said, I don't know whether you will, you know, like this or whether you are ready for this. The sociology class is waiting and the lecturer said that, um, he will not want to lecture today. He wants to expose the English uh, students, that's the uh, British uh, students, to sociology uh, the way it is in Africa. Do you think you'll be ready to, you know, speak to them? Oh, I said, give me five minutes, you know, to prepare my outline, you know, because I always like all these alliterations. You know, if I start with a P, I go with a P. And um, so I said, uh, give me five minutes. And they gave me five minutes and then I got there and I said, how much time do you have? You know, because I could take them on for more than one hour. And so they said, well, we have, uh, you know, about one hour, but we don't want you to spend all the one hour. We'd like you to spend about 30 minutes in lecturing us and 30 minutes question and answer time. And uh, then they said, do you, did they tell you it's not Bible we want? It's such, I said, yes. <laughs> I said I knew, I knew about that. And uh, so I started with them and I began to lecture them on Africa, you know, just sociology, about the politics, about the places, about the people, about a lot of things in Africa. I couldn't uh, cut myself to 30 minutes, I spent 45 minutes. Then I said, now you can ask your questions. And if you know British uh, university students, they asked questions. And they thought they will, you know, they will ask questions that will, you know, just make you to say, well, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare, I, didn't, I don't know about that. But we took another 45 minutes answering those questions on sociology. And I didn't quote the Bible. I quoted, you know, authorities and, you know, in Africa, this and this. I gave them statistics, I, you know, just off the top of my head. When we finished, uh, the assistant pastor that went with me said, now you must tell me something. <laughs> that uh, you, you have never lectured in sociology. You told me you lectured in mathematics before. I said yes, but uh, I don't restrict myself to just one area. You, you know, if you are going to reach out, you have to be broad, broad, broad-minded. And then he said, but apart from that, I'm even surprised too that apart from the fact that you never lectured that before, you have been, because I stayed, I was living with that pastor. 
you know, I will go from their house to their church. And they said, I'm surprised the way you spend your life. I don't come out in the morning to take breakfast, breakfast in time. I study. I give myself to studying. And that, uh, you know, you are called here. I thought that these people will embarrass you with questions. And he said, you know, he is white. He couldn't do that. Even with those students who are white like himself. And you are a black man coming from Africa. And you, you know, can do this at ease. I said, yes, because we have a calling to be students. And that's what I'm passing on to you. We must be students. You see, I went to Zambia. And uh, as I got to, we went to preach the gospel. And, you know, we had a retreat. As we were coming back, we had to come back through Zimbabwe. And we stayed in the house of a family. You know, this, uh, you know, highly placed uh, family. And they had uh, one of their daughters who is uh, in, uh, you know, at school. And uh, the girl was laboring with, uh, you know, some mathematical uh, jargons. You know, she had difficulty. And we are there overnight, uh, myself and my wife, were there uh, with the family. So that the next day we'll be able to take a plane from Zimbabwe and come to Nigeria. And because I was free that uh, time, uh, I saw that, you know, the girl went to the mother and said, Mommy, this thing is too hard. I can never understand. Mathematics is not my, you know, it's not my way. And I overheard what he was saying. And I said, what's the matter? Can I be of help to you? And uh, so uh, she said, uh, well, this, um, we're talking about mathematics, I yes. <laughs> I said, yes, I know. Um, you know, and she, she sat down and I said, what don't you understand? She said, she doesn't understand this. I said, well, we must do some remedial teaching before I get to that. You see, sometimes you have to go to A before you get to B. Get B before you get to C. I saw that her problem is she didn't understand a principle or a theory before that thing. So I went on that. Now, that doesn't have to take me 30 minutes, you know, if you've been teaching for a long time. And after I got her through that, then I came to the problem. And uh, she, she paid attention and she understood everything. And we arrived at the answer. You know, as a young, uh, a young girl, she went to the back of the book to compare the, <laughs> to compare the answer with the answer with God. And I left her alone to check up. And she said, oh, oh it's correct. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you ought to be students of the word of God. But not only being students of the word of God, if you are going to reach out to schools, you ought to know enough that you'll be able to say, you are not just a fellow that is, you are preaching what you don't understand. You go deep into the word of God. You know the lives of the people and you can teach authoritatively. So then, number four, you are called to be students. No, you are writing as if that is a new thing. It's still the same thing. One, sage. Two, steward. Three, soldier. Four, student. And uh, number five, servant. Now, we're going to concentrate on that thing now, on servants. Now, as servants, we are being called to preach. And we are being called to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have point three to discuss with you briefly. Number one, responsibility of fishing responsibility of fishing number two reasons for failure number three role of faithfulness let's go back to number one responsibility of fishing in mark chapter 4 verse 19 it says unto them follow me and i will make you fishers of men brothers and sisters here is our calling and here is a calling that we must fulfill by all means. We must fulfill this calling as servants of God, stewards of the mysteries of the gospel, as soldiers of Christ. Here is our goal. Here is our aim. Here is our ministry. Here is our calling. Be fishers of men. And you see in the schools, or among the youth, you must make sure that in your life you are committed to this ministry or this calling of fishing for men and women. In fact, in the world in which we live now, people are getting to realize the importance of fishing for students, fishing for young people, 
fishing for uh, the people that are still below the age of 25. Do you know that in the world in which we live today, 50% of the population of the world is under 25 years of age. That means we have two and a half billion people. I didn't say million, billion people. Do you know what a billion is? When you write a figure and you put three zeros after that figure, you are talking in thousands. When you write a figure and you put six zeros after that figure, you are talking in millions. When you write a figure and you put nine zeros after that figure, you are talking in billions now. And there are five billion people, actually about five and a half billion in the world, more than five billion. And half of the billions of people make up children or young people below the age of 25, 25 years of age. A lot of people are teenagers. In Africa, here we have 45% of Africa as less than 15 years of age, from 15 and under. Therefore, that means that a lot of work needs to be done by reaching out. And brothers and sisters, do you know, there is a serious neglect of evangelism towards young people. Look at all the churches. All the churches concentrate on reaching out to adults. Even the children, even though they say they have, a, you know, children church or they have whatever Sunday school for children, they're not doing much. They just keep the children away from the adult churches so that nobody will disturb. And when churches are trying to see how they will spend their money, they spend their money on the adults, on the adult church. They don't do so much for the children, for the young, young people. And we need to understand that we have a special ministry, fishing for the young people. And you have that ministry. You have that calling. The question is, will you allow God to continue working with you? And you continue working with God so that you can fulfill your calling. Now, as, even, as you even look at deeper life, it will surprise you that some of the states do not have a vibrant, ongoing, dynamic outreach to the students. As I looked at the attendance of the people today, that is, or yesterday rather, uh, as I looked at the attendance of, at this Congress, now we have more than 400 from Lagos. Then we have a few from all the other states. Do you know there are some states we have less than five that have come now and there are thousands of students or millions of students in those states. Now what will only one representative do from a particular state? What will two, three, five representatives do from a particular state? We need to understand that the student work is a great calling. It's a high calling. You know what I've discovered also? I've discovered that even for those, some of you who are here, that are supposed to be working with um, the students in the secondary school, or maybe you are now at the university, and you came because of the campus fellowship, and because the campus fellowship could not have their congress, we so said, well, let me just join in with these people. And you ought to be working on the campuses, reaching out to those students. You know, there are some of us here who are torn in between two opinions. I know that, you know, our church, especially in the state, will rather have me to be working in the house fellowship and doing this. It's when I do that, they will regard me as a worker. All these other things we're doing with students, our state overseers don't care for them. Because of that, you're unfaithful to your calling. You're discouraged. You cannot really do the work. And this is where we need the greatest number of people to work. You see, adults are very easy to lead. I see thousands of people, you know, at the Bagada Church and also here. Sometimes, myself alone, I could handle all the people together. But get all the children together, it's difficult for one person to handle them. We need more workers. And if you are here as a worker, working with the students and working with the young people, we need you. And you must know that you have a calling and fulfill that calling. Will you? Will you really do it? and motivate and encourage other people that we need them. 
when you get to your state now the states where uh, you know you have not been fully represented you know i don't want to call out the names of of those states you know why when you are when you are rebuking the people that are not there because you who have come you have done well even if you are only one from your state only two or three from your state you have done well if i mention your state now all the other people and you know in the congress here they'll be looking at you kind of funny saying ah so you are the state they mentioned you are the fellow that didn't have uh, many many people will be punishing the present people for those who are absent and we don't want to punish those who are present for those who are absent you know what i mean those who are absent they are the people we ought to rebuke and they are not here even if i rebuke them here now is the people who have done well that will bear the load and the blame of their absence so those people who are here you're only one or two i congratulate you you are good good people but the people that are not here don't tell them <laughs> but they are not very good don't tell them that's what i said <laughs> now we need to understand that we're fishers for men and women for young people and god has given us a ministry a calling and we must do it let's look at john chapter 15 and in verse 16 ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you oh if you think about that isn't it wonderful that god has chosen us uh, you know sometimes um, in our church here we conduct a lot of interviews and we conduct those interviews uh, because um, we need to know where they are at what they are doing what they are able to do when they were saved when they were sanctified and uh, you know sometimes we we disqualify some of the people and we say we cannot choose this one we cannot choose this one because they cannot do the work and uh, you know so as a church we have to do that once in a while but you know sometimes as i think about it some of the people we disqualify the lord will not disqualify but that's all right it's because we're human beings i remember david now very very young and he came to the battlefield and everybody disqualified him in fact i'll tell you this in first samuel chapter 16 don't open let me just tell you the story samuel went to jesus house and he said the lord wants to make a choice a choice of somebody that will do something spectacular for the lord and you know what happened jesse disqualified david why he's too young to be considered and he brought all these other people and even samuel he wanted to choose one of them and god said no a little child shall lead them is the young is the younger that will become the greatest is the younger that will do something that is specific and great and he looked at all the other children he couldn't choose anybody and he said i hear all your children oh he said there's another one but I, i'm sure you will not need that one that's why we didn't call him what's his name his name is david and then samuel said let him come we're not going to sit down till he comes and the moment he appears the voice of god came rushing down from heaven saying that's my man is that young person that i have chosen my point is this you might be rejected and not chosen in your stage when they are thinking about the great 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 workers about the people that will move the stage for god and they may just bypass you but don't you forget you have not chosen me i have chosen you and you know when they were fighting goliath they didn't even remember to take david along they said now david you take care of those animals we're going to do important work for the nation how about david uh-uh you are too young and so they went and samuel led the team and goliath came out and he brought before them their knees were knocking together and then jesse called david and said david now i'm sending you out somewhere for sightseeing not for servanthood not for ministry not for work david you don't have any calling in this area just go and sightsee what is going on and take this patched corn to your brothers who are fighting in the battle of the lord and david got there and he discovered nobody was fighting any battle at all 
Haven't you discovered that in your local government area? Haven't you discovered that in your stage? That where the battle is hottest for the young people, where the battle is hottest with these children in secondary schools, nobody is fighting any battle there. And they think that, well, you are just part of the church. They say, your time is not yet. You cannot serve God now. Yes, years to come. Maybe 10 years after today. When you have grown up higher. When you have become 29. You have become 31. You have become 35. Then there will be some work for you to do. As for now, no work for you. We have not chosen. We cannot choose you now. You are too young to do anything for God now. You depend upon other people now. There's nothing you can do now. That's what they said to David. When David got there, his heart was stirred up. He was challenged. He saw Goliath. And he said, leave me alone. I will defend the glory of God and the name of God. And his elder brothers, they talked to him roughly. They said, you are proud. Haven't they told you something like that before? That, what do you think you are doing? We are talking about we want to have this retreat for adults. We want to have this. And you are talking about students' work. What do you think student work is? Go and sit down. Or we are saying that, you know, the members of the choir should come and sing because we have a great, great program, IFL program. And you come to ask a question, sir, state overseer, can we, student choir, also sing in that place? Student choir. We're talking about adult, adult business. Therefore, please go and sit down. There's no, you don't have a ministry now. Don't be proud. Be careful of pride. <laughs> and, uh, well, Maybe they quiet you and they silence you. You can't do anything. And so, David went ahead and said, what will be done to a man that, you know, can kill this Goliath? Ah, and he said, this is adult business. This is Saul's responsibility. This is a calling of the soldiers. And you are not a soldier. And so he said, take me to Saul. You know, he will not do anything without permission. And Saul saw him, oh, and Saul said, I understand your intention. I understand your good motive, but you cannot. This is a warrior from his youth, and you are just a youth, a lad. And then David began to share some testimonies. Do you have testimony? Yeah. Oh, then share it. Maybe you are too quiet. Maybe you don't tell these state overseers and these pastors what God is doing in the schools how god is reaching out how by the grace of god you are killing the lion and you are killing the bear in all these places david began to tell testimonies oh if it is so if you have to go now can you have adult armor they never think that the armor that david had is enough they never think that the knowledge we have the message we have, the anointing we have, the power we have, they never think it's enough. And so he said, wear this. And you know, they load you down many times with armor. That you are caring for the armor, you cannot reach out to the people. So David said, I'm sorry. I know this may be good for you, but it's not good for me. I've never tried it before. And so Saul took it. And he said, let me use what I've tried before. And he took weapons but don't think that those weapons are so small because we are not walking in the flesh we are walking by faith and the armor that we have is so powerful it will pull down strongholds and he came to goliath i'm sure you know the story goliath came down and david defeated goliath and the philistines began to run why don't you surrender yourself to God like that? And say, God, I know that you have called me. I know you have chosen me. And I know that you are going to make me fulfill my calling and my ministry. If God did it with, with a David, can God do that with you? Yes. Can it happen again? Yes. Do you know that even when David became a king for seven and a half years, he was only reigning over Judah. All the other tribes, they said, David, of all people, not here. But don't mind them. Eventually, they will bow and bend. After seven and a half years, they said, David appears to be doing a good job in that Judah. Why doesn't he come and reign over everybody? Well, they came to surrender and they said, 
David, we didn't know you could make it before, but now we are convinced. Come and reign over us. That man David was not chosen by people. He was chosen by God. The same thing God is telling you this morning. And it says in this John chapter 15 verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you. That ye should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit shall remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name. He may give it you. Which means as you come across difficulties in the work. You can pray. As well as other people can pray. And Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. All the young people, all the students, they are part of the every creature. It is not enough to just read the verse. We must have the full mind of Christ. And wait a minute. I see the problem is not only present day problem. I see it as a New Testament problem. You know why I said that? They brought some children to the Lord Jesus Christ that will lay hands on them and touch them. You know what uh, Peter and the rest of the apostles did? They drove them away. Don't trouble the master. He doesn't have time for little, little children. He doesn't have a ministry towards those little, little children. Let him take care of the adults. You know, a Syrian Phoenician woman came because of a daughter that was suffering. I don't know whether they had secondary school at that time or not. If they did, she would be a secondary school girl. And when this uh, woman came, you know what the disciples said? They said, send her away. Because she's not coming for a Nicodemus. She's not coming for a Joseph of Arimathea. She's not coming for a Caiaphas or a Herod. She is not coming for a Simon, Simon the leper. She is not coming for Zacchaeus. She is coming for just a daughter. Send her away. I find it's a New Testament problem too. But Jesus said, let them come. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. And we need to realize in the church today that the ministry to young people is very, very important. And Jesus is still saying, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are the students part of the every creature? Are the young people that you are supposed to minister to, are they part of every creature? Go ye therefore into all the world. And you see, it, it, it doesn't matter where you go in all the world, you'll find students there. Go to any West African country, East African country, North African country. Go to Asia. Go anywhere, you'll find students there. In fact, you know, what I just studied last night, that now there are 37% in Asia of young, young people. That is, those who are below the age of 15. And it also says there are 38% in Latin America, that's South America, of young, young people below the age of 15. It's in Africa that you have the greatest number, 45% of africans below the age of 15 if they are so many in their millions and billions in the world why doesn't the church wake up and realize that we who have the ministry to the young people we have a great great calling and i'm here to tell you this morning you have a great calling and make the best of that calling concentrate on that calling first corinthians chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Are we like that? Can we commit ourselves like Paul the Apostle? Necessity is laid upon us. I'm talking about our responsibility of fishing for young people. Our responsibility of fishing for the students. Let's go to point two. Why do some people fail? Why do they begin and they never finish up? Why is it they say the Lord has called them to reach out to the young people or to the students? And eventually you find them falling 
back or falling off the side of the road. Reasons for failure. And again, like I did yesterday, I'm going to give you seven reasons why some people fail. Number one, distractions. Number one, of the reasons why some people do not follow through and fulfill their ministry and fulfill their calling. Distractions. First Kings chapter 20. First Kings chapter 20. Verse 39, and as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside, and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life. Or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. You see, this man was distracted. Busy here and there. You see, there are a lot of people that God has given them ministry. But then, they become so distracted, they become busy here and there. You see, as I've watched all over the years, when I was, when I became a Christian, the Lord gave me a vision as well as a burden. And the burden was so serious and the burden was so great that I couldn't shake it up. I knew the Lord wanted me to preach the gospel. I didn't know that I could because I didn't have the boldness, the courage, the ability. It didn't appear that the Lord had chosen a right vessel because I wasn't like, you know, many other people. I knew he wanted me to reach out. And I can remember now as I think back to the 60s and the early 70s, a lot of people that ran ahead and they wanted to preach the gospel. They were bold. They were fiery. It appeared that they could really do a great work. But to see what I discovered... Eventually, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't think that I can do too much, but since you put this burden in my heart, or this vision in my heart, this revelation you are giving me, I said, Lord, I will. And slowly, 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 I got involved, and we started doing it. There is one thing that has been, uh, you know, an advantage for me. The advantage is this, I never get distracted i want to warn you if you do not want to fail in the ministry that god has committed into your hand do not be distracted as i was busy here and there it says the man was gone number two discouragement discouragement this is one of the greatest tools that the devil uses to distract people to make them fail to hinder them. In Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 2 and 3. That Shambalat and Geshem sent unto me saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work. So that I cannot calm down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Verse 9. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, God, strengthen my hands. One of the things that the devil will use is to make you afraid. Is to weaken your hand. Is to belittle the work you are doing. Is to say, after all, how important do you think that work is? That you are giving all your time, all your life. After all, these are not adults. They are young, young people. They are still under the authority of their parents. And even though they say they are born again, if their parents force them to do one thing or the other at home, which is not Christianly, maybe they have no choice. Maybe they have to do it. 
and the children they have no money to support the ministry to the children and so why don't you concentrate on another thing and apart from that you yourself aren't you thinking about your life aren't you thinking about this and that to weaken your hand and so when they said to nehemiah and they said come let's get into some one village and have a private meeting oh he said i'm sorry i cannot come I don't have time for any private meeting. I am doing a great work. You see, why some people don't know that God is doing something is that they do not know the extent of the work they are doing. They don't know they are doing a great, great, great work. If you make that great confession and you stay at it, and you stay at it, and you stay at it, you may discover that you will be among the people that reach the largest student population in the whole world. Well, we're starting today and we're going to carry it through. Amen. And so Nehemiah said, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. And he said, they thought they will weaken my hand. Remember, when problems come to you, the purpose of the devil is to discourage you. Is to weaken your hand that you will not be able to fulfill your calling i believe you will fulfill your calling Amen. number three backsliding that's something that makes people to start doing something and then they cannot do it again in revelation chapter 2 verse 4 and verse 5 nevertheless i have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works but you know the joy of my heart is no matter how fast somebody has backslidden if he wants to still serve the lord he can do the first works again my mind goes to peter and peter became so discouraged and he said I don't think I can continue this fishing for men. Let me go to the lake and fish a while for real fish. And he said, I go a fishing. But I have good I have news for you. You'll think it is bad news, but it is good news. That when somebody that has been chosen by God to do something specific and definite for the kingdom of God, when he backslides, and he says, I'm not interested again. All this preaching, 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 singing for the Lord, and all this studying. You are called to be a saint. You are called to be a soldier. You are called to be a steward. You are called to be a student. You are called to be a, um, a servant. I don't have time for this again. Let me go and enjoy myself. You know, it may look like bad news, but it's good news. When that person goes away to lay his hand upon another thing, that person cannot succeed. He will fail. Peter said, I go a fishing. And some people said, we go with you. About seven of them. Seven out of twelve apostles. And they were by the riverside. And they fished and fished and fished all through the night. The Lord said, children, have ye anything? Have ye any bread? They said no, they had failed. That's the mercy of God. That allowed them to fail like that. Because it was easy now to call them back and say, this is what you have committed your life to doing. Why did you leave it? And since they had no food, the Lord is so wonderful and kind and loving. He prepared something for them. And then he told them, throw your net over there. They threw the net over there and they caught fish they were so interested they began to count and they counted 153 and then when they came to the shore jesus didn't say you backsliders you see how you have failed now he said come and dine and they ate after eating you think that when somebody backslides and he says i'm not interested in that student work anymore eventually when he is restored you think the Lord will say, well, I'm sorry for you. I've given the work to another person already. No more ministry, no more calling. So Jesus faced Peter, the ringleader of the backsliders, and said, Simon, Peter, son of Jonas, do you love me more than this? 
Oh, and he said, I love you. And you know I'm so surprised. Jesus said, feed my sheep. You see, God is not like man. When you come back and you say, yes, Lord, I love you, that's all he needs. He doesn't need for a bucket of tears to come out of your eyes. He doesn't need for you to cry until your intestines are all cramped. And you say, well, I don't know how to cry anymore. Lovest me thou more than this? Oh, yes, Lord, I do. Well, if you do, I take you for your word. I believe you. And therefore, you can feed my sheep. And if you have been backsliding and leaving the work because of discouragement, because of distractions, or because you are loving the things of this present world, the Lord is still asking you today, lovest thou me? I'm sure you love the Lord. And he's telling you, feed my sheep. Number four, the love of the world. I'm talking about reasons for failure. Why some people fail? They fail in the job, in the work, that God has given them to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world. Demas had forsaken Paul the apostle. They were working together before. They were fellow laborers before. But now he loved the present world. There are many things in the world that look attractive but you need to understand that even though these things look attractive all that you are seeing you are seeing the outside of those things when you really get deep into them there is deadly poison in all those things that look attractive to you facially or that look attractive to you outwardly well somebody's eyes was opened and he was allowed to see the devil. And, um, you know, he was in his own house. And the devil came. You see, the, de the Bible says, sometimes Satan is turned to an angel of light. And as this uh, brother, this brother I'm talking about, is passed home to glory now. He's not a Nigerian. He's a British. He died uh, last year. And he had a great, great ministry. And as he... I had this vision. He saw this figure so beautiful. And looking at the color, the skin, everything so beautiful. And the Spirit of God said, You are not looking at an angel, you are looking at Satan. And so, this uh, minister of the gospel, he was used of God in you know, the miracle ministry a lot before he died. And then he said, Satan, I recognize you. And he rebuked him. And he turned to the most ugliest creature he had ever seen. That's what I'm telling you. You see, when you see these things in the world, if you look at the world without the eyes of the spirit, the world will look attractive. Will look beautiful. You will think, I am missing a lot if I don't get this thing of the world. When you look at the eyes of the spirit of God. And you can say, Satan, I recognize you. You will see the most ugliest thing you have ever seen. The world is ugly. There is nothing beautiful in the world. There is nothing attractive in the world. It is only when you are fooled or when you are deceived that you will think there is something attractive in the world. And Demas did not recognize that. He loved this present world and he forsook the work of God. Number five. The love of ease. Love of ease. E-A-S-E. -E. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Acts chapter 13, <coughs> verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Paga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John at this time loved ease. He couldn't bear the hardship of the journey. He couldn't bear the difficulty of the day. He couldn't bear the roughness of the way or the road. Because of that he went back. You see there are a lot of people they are not rugged. They are not committed to real hardship. I thank the Lord. 
You see, 1979, we had an opening in Ghana, actually from 1978. But 1979, we really started going to Ghana, and I will go at the weekend, and we'll go by road, and it was quite hard, quite hard. Sometimes at the borders uh, from Togo to Ghana, they will stop us. And they had no place to put us. We'll just stay in the sun there. And when you're hungry, all that you could eat will be that you will have some, you know, bread or whatever, milk. But those things, sometimes they're so hot that you really don't enjoy them. And eventually we get to Ghana. And the place will get accommodation. The beds will be full of these, uh, you know, bed birds, insects. That when you wake up in the morning, you will see that the whole bed had been stained by your blood. And yet, we needed to do some work there, real foundational work. And you know, sometimes I was there. That time I was a lecturer at the University of Lagos. And when you think about it as a lecturer, I exposed myself to all that type of danger and, you know, bad, bad condition there. And uh, we were there in Ghana. And they closed their borders because they wanted to change their money because uh, of the black market. And when they closed their borders, and I didn't even take permission from the University of Lagos because I, was, I just went on a Friday so as to do something there and come back Sunday night. That Friday, they made the announcement over the radio all over Ghana that they were closing the borders. And uh, some of us went to Accra and we pleaded with the officials that, uh, well, we are not Ghanaians, we don't have your money. They said, we're well, sorry. If we open the uh, border for you, some of the Ghanaians who are outside, they'll try to sneak in. And they wanted to do that thorough exchange of their cities, that's of their currency. So we were not allowed. And I was in there. No money, no food, no good accommodation. And the place we got, the place was so bad, even in my early childhood days, when I was in primary school, I don't remember sleeping in conditions like that. And of course, when you're a university student, and those days, university was, you know, rated high in the, you know, early 60s. I went to university in 1964 at University of Ibadan, you know, a very good, great university. And, uh, you know, to have been in such a place and be in that place in Ghana, it was hard. Very, very hard. No good food. And, you know, there was no tracks for us to use because I didn't go with a lot of tracks. What am I to do now? You know, immediately, I sat down. And since I wrote the tracks in Nigeria here, I could sit down and write new tracks. And the people were lining up in Ghana, in all the banks, because they needed to exchange the old currency for the new currency. Immediately, I wrote tracts on salvation, on evangelism. And the following day, I took them to the press over there. I didn't have money. I said, take my word. I'll pay you later. There's no money now. You know the borders are closed. And they printed everything for me. And I got some people in Ghana. And I distributed them to all the banks where people were waiting. And I said, go and distribute there. When we did that in Kumasi, I sent people to all the towns in Ghana. And I said, this is how to do the work of God. Hard days, but fruitful days. But do you know now? Ghana has established a deeper life. In Accra alone, our church is more than 2,000 in membership. In Kumasi, our church is more than 1,500. They had a retreat this year, April. You know how many people in the retreat? More than 17,000 at the retreat. But you see, you must be able to endure hardship. That's what you do. If you're able to endure hardship at the beginning, and you say, well, I don't care for the hardship, but Mark, John Mark, he couldn't endure. And because of the love of ease, he couldn't at that time continue in the ministry. But thank God, he came back later and God used him. Another point is commitment to personal opinion. Already our time is going, just write that down. Commitment to personal opinion. You know, there are some people... If uh, you don't take their personal opinion, they will just say, well, I can't continue anymore. Why not forget that personal opinion and commit yourself to the work of God? Number seven, love of money. Love of money. And uh, I thank God for the way God has led me. As I look through my life now, 
At that time, nobody understood me. I'm talking about many, many years ago. When I came out of university in 1967, I had this burden in my heart that I should reach out to people. That the only thing I should do is to just reach out to people and preach the gospel. But it so happened that when I came out of university, uh, there were three of us in 1967 that made first class. Two of us in mathematics and one in chemistry. My partner who made first class in mathematics, I, you know, got more marks than himself. But both of us still fell into uh, the first class category. He is now professor at the University of Lagos. And um, when I was lecturing at the University of Lagos, he got there before me. Uh, when I got there, we were in a staff meeting. And, uh, you know, I was being introduced. And he was there. And they didn't know that he knew me. And they were introducing me to him and saying, uh, you know, prof, this is uh, so and so. Oh, he said I know him. Oh, he came out of university together. He, in fact, used to teach me. I used to teach him complex variables. Uh, so, but now he was, uh, you know, professor and all that. But, you see, when I came out of university, the university, without making any application, they gave me scholarship. And they said, I shall come for PhD immediately. I turned it down. I said, no. There's a burden in my heart. There's a vision within me that I need to carry out. And that PhD at that time will hinder me. You know, everybody was surprised. I showed Annie, our principal. He called me and he said, the school may fly. Will release me. I should go. I said, not necessary. I have one of my uncles who was, you know, minister of education in our state. And, uh, you know, all our, my relatives, some of them top level people in, you know, things of the world, in education and in politics. But then, you know, they called me and they said, days and days, I said, I'm sorry. Uh, even though I'm part of the family, I have my life to live. And I'm an individual. I have something I wanted to do. And think about it. At that time, there was no deeper life. But there was the burden and the vision and the revelation. And I knew that something was waiting for me. And you see, when I came to the University of Lagos, Professor C.O. Taiwo, who was uh, leading the provost of the College of Education then, he made arrangement with Chelsea College in London. And he sent me there for about uh, three months to go and do something. They made a private arrangement. They knew they couldn't convince me in Nigeria that I should go for three years. And that time we had started Deeper Life, 1974. When I got there in 1974, the provost over there called me to his office and he said, uh, Mr. Kumoi, we've enjoyed your stay at Chelsea College here for just a brief period, three months, uh, just more than two months, and you are going back. But uh, Professor C.O. Taiwo told me to talk to you and try to convince you if you can stay over here for three years. And you know what they will do? That time I was away, they were paying my salary here and they were paying me salary in London, 1974. And if I stayed there for three years, you know what they will do? They will continue paying my salary every month in Lagos here and paying me. And the salary here was complete. It was not part of the one I was receiving in London. The one in London will be complete. I looked at the professor and I said, sir, I'm sorry. I have something else that I'm doing. It's not only lecturing that I'm doing, that I have to go back to Nigeria. Oh, he said, do you know what you are missing? Do you know what we are offering you? Do you know this and that? Because I will not stay with the student body. I will have separate accommodation in London. I will be free. I will do whatever I wanted to do. And the area I wanted, I should have done the research, was you know, a special area that they didn't have at the University of Lagos. I said, I know what you are saying, but I cannot do it. I will have to turn down the three years of, you know, easy life in that place. You know, when I was there, I was attending lectures only Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think. Only two days in the week. And the rest of the time, I studied on my own. You know, because I went as a lecturer. I, wasn't, I didn't go as just a student. Now, I turned that down because of what I had to do. And I came back to Nigeria. When Professor Sio Taiwo saw me, he said, you are back? I said, yes. He said, uh, did Professor such and such speak to you about this offer? I said, he did. He said, uh, what are you thinking about it? I said, you know, sir, I'm sorry about this, that I cannot take it all. He said, is it because of this Bible study? Because, you know, we're having Bible study at that time at the University of Lagos. Is it because of this Bible study? I smiled. I said, yes, sir. 
he shaved his head and he said, what a pity. And you know, uh, another time, Tashiolani wrote an article in the newspapers. He was, Ty was a little bit angry. And he wrote about all these people that are wasting their brain. And he wrote about Okoji, mentioned my name, mentioned another fellow, that these people that have great, great brains and talents, they are in religion. Much. All that doesn't bother me. I have a call. Do you have a call? Do you, are you ready to do something for the glory of God in the life in which we are living now? I believe you will do something. I said I believe you will, you will do something. Are you willing to pay the price? Or now, as you look at what God is doing now, do you think I have anything to regret about? Am I regretting that, you know, all these wonderful things, you know, in the world, that I kicked them off and now I am doing what I'm doing? You know, if you are like me and you have seen all these blind eyes opening, you have seen all these lame people walking, you will see, men, you have seen mental people, you know, receiving sanity immediately. You know, 19, uh, 1980, and that time we have started Deeper Life, we had a crusade at um, Tafa Balewa Square in August 1980. But before then, I needed, because I was still lecturing, I needed to do some research program. And my supervisor was in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And so I needed to go to him. And from the University of Lagos, I was given three months and also given another three months because they thought the thing will take me six months before I finished. And I went. And when I got to Alexandria, I told my supervisor, I said, supervisor, I must go back in August. He said, look, you have come from Nigeria. Forget about that uh, religion. Because you're always in a hurry. He was in Nigeria before. He said, when I was in Nigeria, you never gave enough time. And therefore, we couldn't finish this, uh, we couldn't finish this research work. And now, if you don't pay attention and you are not patient and you are, you know, talking about uh, going back to Nigeria, you'll never finish this thing. I said, um, how long should it take? Oh, he said, it will take us the six months they have given you. And, and if it took those six months, I'll not be able to come back to Nigeria and have that crusade. And the university had paid for everything. You know, they paid the flight, they paid money, they paid a lot of things. You know, when you are sent out like that, it's, you know, it's just enjoying life. And um, <clears throat> so I told him that, well, supervisor, if you can just uh, go at my pace, don't go at your pace, that I'll finish within the time and I'll still go back to Nigeria. He said, there's no way it's impossible because they are taking a lot of people in research work and they are never able to finish like that. I said, well, just give me the problem and then I will go and work on it. Then he'll give me the problem and I say, when do I come back? He'll say, come back in two weeks time because in research work, you will not be able to, you cannot read it in the library. You cannot read it anywhere. You have to, you know, work it out yourself. It has never been done. That's what we call research. And uh, so I said, but will you be around tomorrow? Who is? He will say, I'll be around, but, but uh, you cannot finish. It will take another two weeks. The second day I've done it and I go back to him and he will look at it and said, how did you get it? I said, because I need to go back in time. <laughs> and then, well, before about, I think, five or six weeks, I had finished. And he wrote a recommendation to the University of Lagos, and he said he has never seen something like this in all these years of supervising research work. And he told them, this man, university needs him, grab him very well. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's difficult for them to see anything like that. And yet, do you know, at the time I was doing that, I read my New Testament, I don't know how many times. Even in, in Alexandria. Uh, he thought I was spending all my time doing research, but not me. I spent all my, I was already preparing my message for the crusade I was going to have here. And that's where I got some of the messages that I preached at that time, take ye away the stone. It was while I was over there. You know, I could do all that and still do all this. I could manage everything together. But eventually, I decided I wanted to resign. The first time I resigned at the University of Lagos, they threw back the uh, resignation paper to me. They said, no, you are not going anywhere. 
They said, you can do all the preaching you want to do, preach on radio, preach on television, preach anywhere, keep the job. And I, the following year, I resigned again. And before I turned in the application to resign, I had to go and beg the head of the uh, department and say, head of the department, please, uh, when they consider this thing, please support me and release me that I want to go. There's a lot of work wait, waiting for me. He looked at me and talked to me. But because even though he was head of the department at that time, he was my junior at the University of uh, Ibadan. So because he was my junior, I could talk to him. And he said, okay, if that is what you want. That's eventually I got released. It was by force that I had to leave University of Lagos. All those things could have distracted me. But do you know that now I don't have any regrets? There's nothing to regret about because I enjoy because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the I just thank God for all his provision. I just blessed you with the